This here was suggested to me by someone uh, in my comment section, and that is the evolution of the Indo-European languages. And it's an ancient civilization documentary, you know. How did this language come about, you know what I mean? How did it evolve into what it is today? We're going to go ahead and uh, see what it is. Welcome to Mr. Giant Reacts, a ting, a ting, a ting. Let's go ahead and YouTube and Sim Simmer and see what this is all about. Kings and generals, boy. One of my favorites. Portugal and India share a lot of common history ever since Vasco da Gama's voyage. But what may come as a surprise is that the Portuguese language already shared many similarities with the numerous languages spoken in India, including inflection, word structure, pronunciation, and vocabulary. Languages constantly change and adapt, but in the case of Portuguese, Hindi, Farsi, Latin, Greek, English, Polish, and many others, there is only one common ancestor which binds them all into a single family. Bienvenidos al primer video sobre la evolución de las idiomas indoeuropeas. Wait, did you know you can watch this video in Spanish and four other languages? You can simply change the audio track in the video settings. We generated these audio tracks using Aloud. Aloud lets creators translate their videos at no cost and with no special skills needed. We've been using Aloud for months already, and we can see that it brings value to our viewers. If you think more creators should make videos available in other languages, check out the link in the pinned comment. Let's overcome the language barrier in videos I'm together. To check that out. For millions of years, evolution was the main pathway of human development, as genetic information was passed down from one generation to the next. It was that same force which gave humans very unique tools, which we use to climb the food chain such as opposable thumbs, sweating, and larger brains. Then suddenly the ability to make complex sounds, and more importantly, the acute sensitivity to comprehend speech, ushered in the development of languages, which allowed us to pass knowledge at a speed that dramatically surpassed evolution. Languages to this day remain an essential part of our everyday life, as they help us communicate, express ourselves, and define our identity. Over the years, thousands of languages have gone extinct, and yet there are still over 7,100 of them, divided into 442 families. The largest among them, spoken by 3.2 billion people, or 46% of the world's population, is the Indo-European language family. The story begins with the incredibly influential Yamna... You know, you know that, that makes you think, you know, what if the people who have colonized the world was like Africa or, uh, or, or, or the, the, the Chinese, uh, you know, colonizing the new world and things like that. What would the language be like? Would there be English? You know what I mean? Would the Indo-European languages go extinct at a, at a faster rate? You know what I'm saying? And uh, it, 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 man, to think and just think of language in 50 years with the way, you know, technology has uh, cut through the language, you know, like instead of saying laugh out loud, they say LOL, you know, instead of saying by the way, they say BTW. And some people are actually using these in conversations now. BTW, so, 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 <laughs> I hear people say that stuff, you know what I mean? What did that become prevalent in the new or the evolution of language? That's an interesting thought right there. Naya culture at around 4000 BC in the Pontic steppe of modern day Ukraine. Its people were semi nomadic pastoralists who domesticated cattle, dogs, and above all, horses. This is where the oldest discovered wheels were uncovered, as well as burial sites that show one of the earliest forms of ownership. Compared to the widespread communal tombs we find in most societies, the Yamnaya burial pits belonged to clans, families, or even individuals, sometimes buried with entire wagons. Combined with the fact that they were one of the first Bronze Age cultures, this allowed the Yamnaya to spread across Eurasia on their horses. This expansion was swift and aggressive. Rather than developing their own colonies, they interbred with the local Neolithic cultures, spreading their genes, as well as their Proto-Indo-European language. No, no, check this out. The evolution of the language 
could be a survival thing too, you know what I mean? Because like they were nomadic, they were going from place to place in order to eat or, or, or to find goods. They have to communicate with the locals because whichever geographic area you are, the food is going to be different, right? So you would have to learn their language in order to uh, survive. And then if your culture is more powerful or more dominant, it would slowly but surely take over the language that's uh, indigenous to that area. You know what I mean? And, you know, due, due to the political... Uh, uh, how should I put it? Political uh, things, for lack of a better word, you know what I mean? The language will evolve, you know, and then the, the, the weaker of the two tribes or people or nations would have to adapt in order to survive. So it was kind of forced to a certain way. And even in some, some uh, uh, cultures, and I've heard some of the Irish people said that that was... Uh, what happened to their language where it was forbidden and against the law to speak their own language, which is a, a sort of a, a forced, uh, what do you call it, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, assimilation into the culture, you know what I mean? You're not going to get this if you don't speak that language, which in modern times you kind of sort of see that happening with the people here in America. Oh, you better speak English. When you come to this country, you better learn to speak English which I think is kind of courteous and stuff to, to, to want to do that. Like if I go to, to Venezuela, I want to know some Spanish, you know, because that's what they speak there. Uh, so what you're seeing here now is that some, some people want to have English as a dominant language. And people are actually, I've seen videos where people get into arguments and fights because other people are speaking in their own language and it's the fear of having that language take over their language which means they would kind of lose power to a certain degree. You know what I'm saying? In time, the speakers of this language became isolated from each other and regional dialects developed into their own daughter languages, a process that continues to this day. Using the comparative method, linguists and archaeologists were able to reconstruct the original ancestor vocabulary, despite the fact that it was never written down in fact, the words for writing, sea, and iron are vastly different across the many Indo-European languages, since those concepts arose after the original migration. However, the words that were commonly used by the Yamnaya people were nearly identical across Latin, Germanic, Ancient Greek, Hittite, Slavonic, Avistan, and Sanskrit. On your screen, you can see how the cognate words for family remained mostly the same across Indo-European sister languages, including words for family members, mother, father, brother, sister. This is also the case for various verbs describing actions that were fundamental to the lifestyle of the Yamnaya people, like sew, cloth, eat, drink, carry, give, die. The same can be said about various objects, animals, and particularly the word wine, among them tooth, bone, eye, night, God, water, fire, tree, new, young, pig, sheep, beaver, honey, brew, wine. One of the very first things we learn in a new language are the pronouns and basic numbers. And yet again we see that both are shared throughout the various different cultures. I, you, we, as well as the numbers from 1 to 10. Languages and pronunciations changed as they grew apart and interacted with each other as well as other languages outside the Indo-European family, adding and exporting loan words. But the writing that these various cultures developed hints at their shared origin. The comparisons between the Greek god Zeus and Roman god Jupiter are often discussed, but in reality, both of these gods are adaptions of the original Yamnaya god Perkunos, the striker, a concept also shared in Hittite culture as Tahuna, in the Thracian tribes as Zipothyridos, while Dacian tribes knew him as Gebelizis. Albanian culture groups knew him as Perendi. Baltic mythology has Pecunus. Slavic people know him as Perun. Celtic tribes as Taranis. While the Norse people split the singular concept into Thor and Odin. Anglo-Saxon mythology knew him as Thunor, and Hindu people initially believed that Indra was the king of heaven and thunder. 
Additionally, the very concept of an overarching conflict between rain and the sun, water and fire, man versus beast, most likely a You know what's cool while watching this year is like how we are intertwined as far as what we believe and we seem to think that ours is unique but then language in of itself is telling us that we're not as unique as we think we are so was it an idea that was just already there or was it the collaboration of all the different uh, beliefs and, and and you know all of that 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 created this that we know today, you know, for you know, for lack of a better way of putting it, you know what I mean. So, so nothing is really unique. Everybody is borrowed from everybody because if a different tribe come and they have a different name, God, even though it's the similar or the same type of concept, it's just a different name. But if you study it and you do research, you're gonna say, well, wait a minute, that's just like you know. The others, they just have different names to it. Like you know, a lot of ancient African uh, tribes had they had names for the sun god and the, you know, and the the, the moon god is so whatever. You know what I mean? You, know, you see where I'm going with this? So, you know, we're not thinking that different, are we? We're not thinking that different. Now, is it because? Well, actually, the, the, the coming together of all these cultures proves that we're not that different in our thought process really you know what i mean the, the, the difference come when you have nationalistic stuff going on when you have tribal stuff going on you know what i mean and is that basically just human beings trying to disassociate themselves from others i don't know Let, let's keep going rose from the proto-indo-european legends while it is easier to imagine the various subgroups of the Proto-Indo-Europeans as separate branches, it is more accurate to view them as waves that constantly moved and interacted with each other and others. That being said, the first major branch we will look at is Italic, a language that spread alongside Celtic until the Alps split the two around 1500 BC. By 300 BC, the language was fighting for its survival against its Celtic, Illyrian and Greek neighbours, who dominated the north and even eliminated the Sicil branch in Sicily, with only Fascilian, Umbrian, Oscan and Venetic remaining. And then suddenly the Roman Republic rose from obscurity and spread the Latin language across the Mediterranean and Western Europe like wildfire, obliterating all other Italic and most of the Celtic languages in the process. Wow. The Latin language itself had two variants, Classical Latin, which was the formal language, and Vulgar Latin, which Cicero describes as the speech of the masses. A standardized and universal language in the empire, one that brought status and economic opportunity, was one of the tools that allowed the Romans to establish themselves as a military and cultural powerhouse. Yeah, you know, this, this kind of makes me think, you know what I mean? It's like... On the island, we, we see British people are speaking perfect English, you know, but that was before you realized there's different dialects and stuff all through the areas because there's different people that settled in different areas and things. But, you know, the, oh, this, the, 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 the English, they speak uh, so, so much proper English, better English than us. But in some instances, if you check out the dialects in certain parts of England, you have no clue, you know, uh, what they're saying. Uh, I did a video about uh, uh, why are British names so hard to pronounce, and I I'll leave a link in the description for that one. But you know that that just shows that even though the dominant language is English, there is still remnants of other languages that was incorporated into it, and you know just by the names of the towns. Because in that video, they, 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 they sort of uh, differentiated it a little bit between Celt uh, Celtic language and Anglo-Saxon language and then the Roman language. You know what I'm saying? You could tell the difference there. Some of it sound more English than others. However, due to the size of the empire, many regions began developing a distinct dialect unique to the province. And when Rome fell, those dialects evolved into their own languages, 
ushering in the dawn of the Romance languages. The subdivisions of Romance include the now extinct British, Pannonian, and African Romance languages, Sardinian, African which Romance is an incredibly language. conservative language, Romanian, and finally one of the most dominant subdivisions, Western Romance, featuring Italian, French, Spanish, and Portuguese. To simplify what could be its own video, each of these languages underwent significant changes throughout the Middle Ages, as various feudal states and dynasties struggled for power internally and externally. This resulted in dozens of dialects within each language. But if you know, let's modernize this a little bit, you know what I mean? It's kind of like uh, how rap music become prevalent and the language that they speak or the dialect that they speak have become prevalent with young people. You know what I mean? Homeboy, you know what I mean? Uh, 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 these days they don't say a lion, they say a capping. You know, just simple things like that. You could see the, the evolution of the language depending on the culture that uh, that is taken over at the time. Of course, these days everything is a trend. You know, so the core language seems to be surviving. But, you know, sometimes I speak to some of those uh, people who are in the hip hop, uh, into hip hop, and it's like, what did that person just say? <laughs> you know what I mean? But you could see the same thing for the islands too, because look at Jamaica. They speak English, but you don't understand it because the, the language is evolving. They don't speak as proper British English as they used to. They call it patois now, you know what I mean? If we draw a line between any two points between these countries, the further you go, the harder it is to understand the local language. But as the Middle Ages came to a close, and states became more centralized, rulers selected the dialect of their hometown and emphasized its use, a process mirrored in every other branch. The Castilian kings chose Castilian as the foundation for Spanish, discouraging the use of Galician, Leonese, Basque and Catalan and eliminating Mazarabic, and this process was finalized by the so-called Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabella, who understood the efficiency of using just one language to rule their realm. The French kings ruling from Paris chose the Longue spoken in the north, rather than Ottocan or Franco-Provencal, as King Francis I formalized this in 1539 with the ordinance of Villiers-Cotrey, which was also aimed against the power of the Ottocan nobles and Catholic Church. The unification of Italy occurred much later, but a similar process ensued after the Tuscan dialect was chosen as the foundation of Italian. Modern day Italy could give us a glimpse of what other countries looked like, as there are numerous local dialects with varying degrees of differences between them. For example, an Italian from Florence is more likely to understand a person speaking in Spanish rather than another Italian from Sicily. Nationalism, education and literature are always major drivers of standardization and help shape languages within a certain state. But given enough time and isolation, speech can alter dramatically, even if the writing system remains the same. That is exactly what we see in the colonies of the Romance languages. Mexico, Quebec and Brazil all share the languages of their founders but they also developed their own unique features. Yep. The next major branch we will review is Proto-Greek, which arrived in northern Greece around the 3rd millennium BC. The first stage of its evolution saw the rise of Mycenaean Greek as the dominant language of the region, with its very own writing, which we now call Linear B. But neither would survive the fall of Mycenaean civilization in the 12th century BC. Instead, around the same time, the Greek alphabet was created, based on the Phoenician alphabet, with a few added letters. It was this same alphabet which would deeply influence the Latin, Cyrillic, Coptic and Gothic alphabets. Armed with one of the first written systems, Greek colonists settled the coast of France, Italy, Anatolia and the entire Black Sea. But despite using the alphabet, rival dialects competed for dominance. As you may have guessed, this rivalry was mostly between the Greek city-states of Athens and Sparta. Despite the popularity of Spartan Doric Greek on the mainland, Crete and Sicily, and military victory over Athens, the Ionic Greek won the cultural war thanks to the works of Homer, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle and others. The fellas. And thus classical Greek became the staple of Greek culture 
and would continue to contribute numerous loan words present in many other languages today. The next crucial figure in this story is Alexander the Great himself, who spread the common version of the language called Koine with his conquests and firmly established it in Greece, as well as Inner Anatolia, Egypt and India. India this too. was the first language in which the New Testament was written. Despite centuries under Roman rule, the prestige of the language with its deeply embedded written form allowed it to avoid the Celtic fate, and when the West collapsed, Koine Greek transformed into Medieval Greek, spoken in the Eastern Roman Empire. By this point, there was a huge disparity between the classic and spoken versions of the language, with the former being used primarily in court and writing. The fall of Constantinople triggered many events, one of which was the transformation of both of these languages. The spoken Medieval Greek turned into Demotic Greek, meaning by the people, and the written language called Katharavosa, which added some elements of the spoken language but mostly resembles classical Greek. The substantial differences in both languages made daily transactions incredibly confusing, and this problem persisted for centuries until it was finally solved in 1976, when Demotic Greek was made the official language still used today. As for Doric Greek, it is spoken by only a few hundred elderly people in southern Greece, oh, wow. and is expected to become extinct in the coming years. It took a significant amount of time for Proto-Germanic to expand beyond a small area in North Europe, during which it already split into three distinct dialects, East, West and North. We know very little about the early stage of this branch, as it used a runic writing system, usually carved on trees. But as the Roman Empire fell, the most famous language from the Eastern dialect spread all over Europe. Gothic was incredibly influential, and left a lasting mark on the continent, despite the fact that it would eventually become extinct. The North dialect, which we now call Old Norse, was also very popular due to the Viking era. It would create West and East variants of its own, from which modern Icelandic, Norwegian, and then Danish and Swedish descended. It is important to note that Icelandic stands out as a very conservative language, which has more in common with Old Norse than any of them once again outlining the important role of geography. geography. During the first millennium BC, Celtic was the lingua franca of Western and Central Europe, largely due to the dominant Urnfield culture. As the branch spread, it split into various other forms, like Lepontic, Celtiberian, Gaulish, Galatian, and others. However, the rise of the Roman Republic would lead to the extinction of all continental Celtic languages. The few surviving speakers migrated to the British Isles, forming what is known as the Insular Celtic Languages, further divided in Godelic languages, featuring Irish, Scottish and Manx Gaelic, and Brythonic languages, featuring Breton, Cornish and Welsh. Despite being so closely connected to each other, the two groups are not intelligible. Each of these languages struggled to endure the centuries of deliberate censorship and oppression from various states. Oh, wow. In total, there are just under one million speakers of the Celtic languages, with half of them being Welsh. In the 19th century, Cornish came very close to joining Pictic and Cumbric in extinction, but has since undergone a revival and now boasts a few hundred speakers. The Celtic language group stands as a clear example of how politics can affect culture in incredibly impactful ways. Yeah. Lastly, we have West Germanic, which spread towards areas disconnected from each other by forests, mountains, wide rivers, and the English Channel. Naturally, this split the language into four notable branches, Old High German, Old Low German, Old Low Franconian, and Anglo Frisian which will inevitably form German, Dutch, and English. The evolution, development, and spread of these languages are very interesting, but extends far beyond the scope of this video. So we'll just share one interesting fact about each of them. The Gutenberg printing press and the Luther Bible set the foundation of a standardized German language, which was essential in the later unification process. When we look at places like Iceland, Albania, or Sardinia, it is easy to understand why those languages are conservative, yet despite having few natural defences, and being surrounded by more powerful states, 
the Dutch language is incredibly conservative. English is a member of the Germanic language family, yet only 26% of its vocabulary is Germanic, 29% of it is French, and 29% is Latin. Wow. Alongside these four major branches, there are several others, which we would love to cover in future videos, including Balto-Slavic, Indo-Iranian, Armenian, Albanian, not to mention the now extinct Anatolian, Phrygian, Dacian, and Tokarian. Each of these language groups has a fascinating story as it changed throughout the years and under different regimes. The languages spread around the world, while other language groups left a lasting impact on them, particularly Arabic, Turkic, and Hungarian. Like this video and share it with your friends if you want us to de- Wow, that was quite interesting. No, no, for me, I have a simple thing, a simple idea. We know that some of the languages were like banned and you couldn't speak it. We know that the stronger of the group become the dominant language. However, what I would like to think that uh, that also happened along with that, which in, in, in doubt, uh, you know, undoubtedly did, is survival which proves the whole point of me saying that we need each other. You know what I mean? If we can't communicate, we can't trade. If we can't communicate, we can't uh, uh, debate and harbor some kind of a peace within each other to understand each other. You can't, you, you can't find peace with people you don't understand. And the first way to understand somebody is to communicate with them. So then language uh, was was this was just a natural thing to happen also now for the powers that be it might not have been as natural but for like everyday working man it probably was natural for it to happen and it wasn't like my language is better than yours you know it's like I need to communicate with this guy because he's got this goods I need to communicate with this guy because he's got this educational methods you know what I mean so that we could survive in a society that is changing a society that is forming, you know, that's probably going to like dictate to us how we live. We have to, uh, you know, learn about it. Well, this was really interesting here. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I did. Take, you know, I'll leave a link in the description to this video. Uh, kings and generals always have good, insightful stuff. You understand what I mean? And uh, like this video and share it. You know what I mean? And hey, I hope you enjoyed it, man. Y'all take care of each other, alright? Cool runnings.